G'day mate, 40 here. So I'm just listening to New York Times or Roger Cohen essay just how dangerous is the rise of uh, Europe's far right and I think that the dangers would be to whom right it's not like uh, one type of politics or one type of uh, political leader is just generically dangerous right it's dangerous to whom which which groups will get their ox gored and uh, which groups will see their interests represented by a new type of politics. So there's a lot of talk in the mainstream media and among our elites about how dangerous Donald Trump is, but again, it's dangerous to whom? And good for whom? Right? Donald Trump isn't just generically dangerous, he's dangerous to parts of the status quo probably good for other parts of the status quo and how good or how dangerous he is does not just depend on what portion of society you're talking about also depends on circumstance and there are obviously going to be circumstances situations that are more conducive to a Joe Biden or a Kamala Harris or a Donald Trump or Gavin Newsom, right? different people have different gifts and some of them are better in some situations. I excel in some situations and I'm pathetic in other situations. I'm sure there are situations where you excel, other situations where you're average and other situations where you're pathetic. So one reason the far right is rising in Europe is that it's more in touch with nationalist sympathies. So as a result of the cataclysms of World War I and World War II, nationalism got a dirty name in the West, particularly in Europe. And so you've had substitution of the rule of experts. And there are advantages to a rule of experts that override the concerns of the ordinary people, but there are also disadvantages. Right? Sometimes the ordinary people are right and the experts are wrong. Sometimes the experts are right and the ordinary people are wrong. So largely unchecked levels of immigration are driving tens of millions of people in Europe crazy and they accurately and rightly recognize that there's no solution to this problem from conventional politics. Either the parties of the polite right and the polite left, the center right and the center left, have any plan or any ability to grapple with the challenges of unchecked immigration. And so you've got to rise to a type of politics that says we've got a plan to handle this and we're going to be tough and we're going to make decisions on the basis of what's good for the core of our country. And another reason for the rise of the far right is that uh, they have a message that their, their voters should feel good about who they are. So among conventional elites, there is this sophisticated attitude that there, there are many problems with who Europeans are and they have to change and they have to apologize and they have to make reparations and they have to operate against their natures. It's the rise of the Buffett identity. So you're supposed to transcend your more primitive, primitive tendencies of loyalty to blood and soil, to, to a tribe, to a religion, to a particular people to traditional ways of doing things, traditional ways of organizing families, traditional ways of organizing life, traditional forms of marriage, traditional hierarchies that all need to be overthrown so that people move beyond this porous identity where what's going on with your neighbor in your community 
is felt keenly by you and so you might have some traditional medieval allegiances to marriage being between one man and one woman for example or that uh, people should stick with the biological sex that they're born with uh, these are medieval inclinations that uh, the new modern left liberal humanist perspective wants people to transcend and uh, other people don't want to transcend these traditional impulses uh, they don't want to be adapting to courtier morality where they're constantly adjusting how they speak constantly updating their lexicon so as to speak the patois of the ruling elite but a lot of people want to return to the morality of uh, the castle where a man's castle is his domain and notice there's real paucity of strong argumentation against the rise of Europe's far right and just an ever constant evocation of cries of fascism, Nazism. And fascism was a particular time-bound response to a particular set of conditions between World War I and World War II that saw its fullest flourishing in Italy and as a reaction to the rise of totalitarian communism at a particularly delicate vulnerable period of history when many countries saw they were either going to become total parties, total governments of the right or the left. But this is used to smear like, Europe's anti-immigrant parties and uh, this smear might not be so effective anymore. People might have graduated from fear of these derogatory terms. Now there's a good thing about Europe's very rigorous speech laws in that politicians who rise to prominence in Europe, even if they're of the far right, they have to learn to speak in a way that is much more careful than uh, politicians on the right in the United States. So I like the American freedom of speech and the First Amendment freedoms, but I recognize their advantages to Europe's speech restrictions in that they force people in public life to adapt a more thoughtful and considerate way of speaking that doesn't just appeal to the most primitive parts of the population. So the dominant liberal left ethos is actually about we should rise above traditional loyalties, traditional symbols, while the rising power of the far right you know, ties into traditional symbols, traditional practices to easy ways of feeling such as loyalty to one's nation, to one's tribe, to blood and soil. But overall, Europe's far-right parties, like Europe's center-right, center-left and left-wing parties, rise and fall depending on their success with meeting the needs of the population. Right? If they more effectively meet the needs of the moment, of the situation in which they find themselves in power, they'll retain power. What would determine the success of a government, as Harold Macmillan said? Events, my dear boy, events. So there's a lot in this New York Times story about uh, the far right's hostility to immigrants. But another way of expressing that is uh, the right wing's fealty, loyalty, consideration of citizens, of members of the nation, members of the in-group. So that's the, the big contrasting factor between right and left is 
how much hostility do you have to out groups, right? The more right wing you are, the more hostility to out groups. How severely do you want to punish norms violators within the in group, right? The more right wing you are, the more severe you want to do your punishment. And then the other big distinguishing characteristic is do you prefer traditional ways of organizing life in developing families and community or are you more open to doing new things?